It's not about the belt. It's not about the gi. It's not about the dojo. It's about who you are and who you think you are. Hello. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 352. And today, I'm joined by Master David Senapas. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, and I love martial arts. And if you love martial arts, you've come to the right place. At Whistlekick, we make some great stuff. And the thing that we are most known for, of course, is this podcast. It's been going on for quite a while now, and we have no signs of stopping. If you want to support the show, the best way is to head on over to whistlekick.com, use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on everything. We appreciate your support, your help in keeping this ball rolling. Today's guest has, as many of our guests do, an amazing story. But this time, really for the first time, we're talking about an interesting blend of style and culture. It's a unique story. It's one that we haven't heard before. But as unique as it is, it has similarities to so many other stories, reinforcing the idea that we as martial artists are far more alike than we are different, even when we see someone who has led a very different life, has traveled a very different path than the one that maybe we have. And that's why I was so excited to have Master Center Pass on the show. We had a great time. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to it. So let's do it. Master Senapas, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I'm, I'm honored to be here today uh, to share some of my adventures and stories with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to have you here. And, you know, listeners, I'm, I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to spoil it. But we're going to talk about some stuff today, some, some martial traditions that are, are different. And that's always been one of my goals for the show is to bring as many different people of as many different backgrounds on as possible. Because I think that the more we do that, the more we get to see that, you know what, we're not that different. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all really trying to do the same thing with roughly the same tools. And that makes us far more alike than it does different. I mean, would you, would you agree, sir? Am, am I... I, I do agree on that. Yeah, that um, our, our lives are on the same road, but sometimes the roads are so far apart that we don't see each other. Mm. Yeah, totally. All right, so let's, let's start. It's, it's kind of a cliche way to start, but it's the way we have to start. How did you find martial arts? Well, uh, that's a, quite a long story. Um, I, I want to go back to um, when I was very young, that I, I wasn't in the States, that I lived on a reserve and I was very young before I came to the United States, and we stayed um, secluded on a mountain for many of years. And my English wasn't so good when I came here because um, when I came here, I, I joined your schools, your educational schools, and I didn't speak very good English. So I, I started school when I was, uh, I started in the fourth grade here and ended up um, uh, not getting. Uh, along so well with the population, I would say, uh, because I was a little bit different and my color skin was different and I spoke a different language and where I came from, it wasn't exactly, they weren't welcome to the native tradition, I guess. And um, I got picked on quite a lot. My, my first um, self-defense was um, uh, wrestling. Uh, um, we, as, as natives, uh, we used to wrestle quite a lot. My grandfather, my uncle used to wrestle. So they taught me how to wrestle uh, right off. And a lot of the times I went to school that I, get, I got into situations that I needed to defend myself or to wrestle. So that was to the native community. But when I got a little bit older and went into um, seventh, eighth grade, um, the wrestling turned into more fist fighting. And, and, the, and I can handle one person but it was like two or three other people that it was hard, harder to uh, defend myself. So my father was a Olympic boxer. Uh, he he, uh, he um, taught me how to box, uh, and, um, and I did that for uh, several years. But uh, again, um, uh, growing up in a non-Native community, that um, 
I got into more fights and ended up um, getting beat up quite a lot because, uh, like I said, I can handle one person, but uh, two or three people I could not handle. So my, I think my dad um, suggested that I, I take up some sort of self-defense. And in, um, when he went to the Army, they uh, showed him jujitsu, and he showed me some of the jujitsu, but he wasn't a teacher in it. He showed me some of the moves. But I ended up going to um, a karate class that was in Prescott at the time. And I, I think it was like uh, $22 a month or uh, twice a week. And, and I did that for quite a long time. I did that for almost two and a half years, maybe less than that. And came proficient in the kata. And, and I was young and, and I had an attitude. And, and my attitude was that I fought with anger, you know, that. I, I didn't use the martial arts. I just ended up fighting with anger and, and ended up still losing. So I, for quite a long time that I, I it, was, it, was tra- it was Taekwondo. And that's quite of an um, extensive art. There's a lot of exercise and stretches and things like that. And it, it is a, a proficient art if you um, can adapt it to your life. So... Uh, how would you uh, finish the story? Uh, the story, um, I was in competition um, uh, after several years in Taekwondo, and I went to um, Bangor, Maine for a demonstration. And there was other um, classes there uh, doing demonstrations. There was uh, people that was in the local areas that um, were instructors that they were uh, recruiting for their classes, and there was a pretty big gym. and. Our class went there. Uh, I think in our class at that time, we had about 30 or 40 people um, do, will do kata and, and, of course, some, some of the demonstrations and takedowns and like that. And, uh, and I, I was there to break ice, and I had uh, one-foot ice blocks, four stacked up, and, then I, and I broke ice with my hands. And that was part of my demonstration. In, in um in that demonstration, there was a, another class there, and they were doing uh, dance. It looked, well, it looked like dance from my point of view. And uh, I watched them for a while, and it was like it wasn't Tai Chi, and, and it, um, but it was, it was a pretty complicated dance. And now, so I watched that a little bit, and one of the um, students come over and, and, and uh, said, oh, you can break ice. And I said, yeah, I broke the ice. And, he says, well, you should come over and watch our class sometimes and see what we do. And, and, and stupid me <laughs> said, uh, yeah, I said, that looks interesting, probably, but you probably can't win a fight in that, or uh, I wouldn't try to do that in a fight. He said, oh, the guy, his name was Dan, the, uh, Daniel, the guy that came and introduced himself. He said, well, you should come over and meet Master. He says that, you know, you, you can ask him some questions. So at the end of the, um, the demonstration, that I was packing up, ready to go, and uh, they were saying, and Dan comes up, says, come over and meet, meet the master. And, and I come over and went over there and uh, met um, some of the students. And the students didn't have um, a uniform or a gi or anything like that. They, some of them were just in regular clothing. Some had a, a gi top or something or a kung, kung fu uh, uniform. But they, they didn't, wasn't organized in the uniforms. So... The master come over and, and said, oh, hi, I've seen you break ice. And he said, that you're very powerful and things like that. I said, yeah. And then we got talking. And he explained what the art he was doing. He says, we're not dancing. He said, we call it the dance of death. And I thought that was so cliche. And I started laughing. And um, he said, well, you should come to the class sometimes. And uh, we can show you what else that we do. And I said, oh, well. He says, it looks all in good. He says, but it would never work in a fight. You, you, you could not do that in a fight. He says, you need to be able to, to, be able to break it with power and, and the stress and everything. He said, well, this power here is just hidden. So I think a couple of weeks passed by, and one of the other students that I met, um, uh, she was in a, one of our other classes in, in Taekwondo, and he says, well, you should come down. I'm going down. Why don't you come down with me? So I said, I'll go look. And she, she said, she worked on my ego. She said, maybe you can show the master something. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I probably can do that. 
is, is I have a black belt in Taekwondo, you know. And I went down there with my gi and my black belt. And, of course, I put that on and nobody else in the class had a gi or a black belt. Everybody was just dressed normally. And master comes out and he introduces himself again. So I'm glad you can make it. And he says, he says um, um, she said that you had some stuff to show me. I said, yeah, I can show you some stuff. He says, well, um, let's go out on the mat. So we went out on the mat, and, and here I was in my gi. Um, my, um, I had a black bottom and white top and black belt. He says, how would you defend yourself from a blow? And I said, well, I would block and do roundhouse, and I did all this other stuff. And I said, he says, why don't you hit me, and I'll show you what we do. I said, and at this time, the, the master looked like he was ready for the old folks' home. He was skinny, hardly no hair. He had um, you know, Nike sneakers on. The pants was too short. Uh, he had a white button-up shirt. It didn't look like nothing. He looked like, you know, if I hit him, I could break him in two. And I said, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. I said, I have a black belt. I could hurt you, you know. He said, no, go ahead. And he kind of pushed me with that one hand. He kind of pushed me back, and I kind of tripped. And I said, well, and he said, that was, I said, no, I don't want to. Then he pushed me again. Then um, he ended up um, uh, pushing me so hard that I kind of came off my two feet and landed on my but on the on the ground, he says, "Go ahead, hit me." And I, and I get up. I said, "I'm going to leave." I said, no, 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 "This is getting crazy. I'm going to leave. If I kicked you, hit you, I can hurt you." He said, "No, come back here." And then he, when he did that, he took his finger and put it on my shoulder. And as soon as he did that, I had a sharp pain going right through my back and my arm. And of course, I re, I, I reacted to that and I, I tried to push him back, but I, I he wasn't there. I ended up. Uh, kind of going forward a little bit and, and falling on, on my shoulder and getting back up. I, and I said, no, I'm going to go. So he, he grabbed me and then I did an arm lock and put me down and uh, put his feet right around my neck uh, to choke me out and let me go. And of course, then I got mad. Then I tried to hit him. I, I didn't hit him. I, I tried to kick him. I tried to grab him. I tried to do all the different things that I learned and ended up uh, falling on my face and, and um, get, just getting so embarrassed. I, I got so embarrassed that uh, I, I usually don't tell people this, but I got so embarrassed that I cried. I was crying. And I ended up um, uh, running out of the, his dojo and, and getting in my car and going home. So that's part of that story that, you know, that people don't really realize that, you know, it's not about the belt. It's not about the gi. It's not about the dojo. It's about who you are and who you think you are. And I, at that time, I thought it was, you know, pretty bad, you know, because I did get into fights and I was starting to win some fights. I ended up uh, not going to school for a couple of weeks and um, him, him calling the house. And I thought that was kind of weird that he knew my number. Back then, we didn't have a computer or, or anything of that technology, but he called the house and see I, how I was. And... Um, and I did talk with him that day. And I said, I'm fine. He said, well, you should come back. There's, you know, that's more to that. And that, to me, it was a bunch of trickery. And he said, and I'm thinking in my mind, he tricked me. You know, he, he tricked all, he did all these tricks on me to, to uh, put me down. And said, and so I went down, um, I think about a month later, to his class. And I was still taking Taekwondo from another class. And, um, of course, I wore my, my black belt and my gi. And he didn't say anything about that. And he had me sit on, um, it was, he had some bags in there of oat, oat and, and something like that. And I sat on this bag for about a month uh, watching the class. I'm waiting to, to join the class, but he never said to join or anything like that. But after about a month and a half, that uh, I got up and, and start learning this dance, what they was doing. And, and it was, they were skipping. That's really what they were doing. And um, there was no hits. There was no uh, punches. There was no things like that. It was just learning how to breathe and how to move your body in such a way that it, um, it's sufficient when, when you are moving your hands to breathe. And you could do this forever. It was, it was almost like a kata. But it was like um, regulating your heart and uh, the oxygen 
in, in how to, uh, to affect the breeze around you. And we worked a lot with candles. We had uh, six candles around us. And what we had to do in this dance is to make these candles dance, not to put them out, is to make these candles dance, to make them go low, make the flames go higher. And going through this training, I didn't think the importance of that. I thought I was, I was waiting for the, um, the candy. I was waiting for when was this good, the real stuff going to happen? You know, when, when am I going to learn how to punch? When am I going to learn how to kick? When am I going to learn how to break boards? Things like that. But for the first year, I didn't do any of that. You know, I had um, anger issues that I, I brought to the surface quite a lot. Is that the anger issues uh, that came is that when I used to get in fights, I used to get beat up and, and black eyes and bloody noses and things like, like that. And I, and I used um, my aggression for aggression. And Master says that a river never... Uh, uses aggression when it flows. And, and I try to come up with an example. Oh, what about a hit and rock? He says, the water grows around. How about a waterfall? He says, it falls, it subsides to gravity. Um, so going through all this, that I wasn't like, like a philosopher. I didn't learn, I didn't come to the light. I didn't, it didn't come to the surface. Oh, this is the way that we should do it. It was, it was a, to me, for several years, it was a fight to uh, learn this because it went against everything that I knew in Native tradition and, and some of the other, other things that I know is to, to not impose force, you know, but if somebody challenges me for a fight, you know, I'm going to pose that force. If somebody was going to um, hurt my family, I was going to defend the family. But it, he taught that, that we are water. Our, we see energy through water, our eyes, our mouth is water, the body is water. Is the, and the, the style that he taught was shokai. And shokai is an old Japanese word meaning energy of water. And to, to learn to um, conduct myself in that way of water. So I think that's, I'll stop right there, but I can elaborate more on, on that. Sure, so, sure. There's a lot there. There's a lot. We just we, we we heard we heard a lot, and it you know the the story that you that you told about being out on the mat. I mean that that's that sounds like something right out of a movie. It does. Um, at that time, that I didn't know who uh, we didn't have TV, so I didn't know of uh, Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris or Joe Lewis or David Carradine. So we, I didn't know of all these people. And uh, I remember being in class and they said, um, somebody wants to be like Bruce Lee. And I thought Bruce Lee was uh, another um, uh, student from another school, like downstate or something like that. I didn't know he was a movie actor. And, you know, people come in and I said, who in the heck is this Bruce Lee guy? I didn't know. I didn't see a Bruce Lee movie until 1982. <laughs> because we didn't go to movies very much. And I didn't. Wow. So. But uh, I did see on TV at one time um, Kung Fu Theater uh, back in the uh, late 70s. And I thought that was so hokey. <laughs> right, right. Because it, because it was. It was. Because it was. But it's still, there, there's still something about it. I mean, we've had quite a few guests on the show who have talked about their love for Kung Fu Theater. And, and there were folks who even found the martial arts from that programming and ultimately, you know, learned that, yeah, it's hokey, but, you know, still has a special place in their heart. Yes. So there's a point in time I want to go back to in the story that you just told us. And it's, it's that, that moment. There was a pivotal moment in there that you kind of moved through quickly. And I, I want to unpack that a bit. So here you are, you've learned a number of martial arts. You've learned some wrestling and some karate and Taekwondo and earned a black belt. And you go to this demonstration and, and you know, you're, encouraged maybe maybe even bribed a bit with with some of your ego right to come and and show this master of this other tradition some of the things that you know and you went and you i i, I mean forgive me for saying it doesn't sound like that first experience was something we would call positive it was it was not positive it, it was <laughs> embarrassing because the, all the yeah. students were watching 
And um, my ego really got slammed that day because I thought, honestly, I was the ultimate, you know, because I had a black belt, I broke ice and boards. I can, I can bend a railroad spike with my hands. And, and, it, and it was like, um, what in the heck did he do? You know, I thought, it was like, I remember staying home for two weeks out of school and, yeah. and I could not figure out what he had done. I mean, there's way be, I thought it was some sort of black magic or, or something that, well, it was something I wasn't known, but uh, he said my ego blinded me from seeing. And mm. I thought that well, I can see perfectly, you know. Yeah, and I used to call him a, a Chinese, Chinese fortune cookie because, and he said, I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese, a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> so what changed, right? So you, you're there and you're embarrassed and you leave and you stay home for weeks and, and he calls you, but something, something about that exchange or the phone call that you had with him, something happened that made you interested enough that you were willing to risk that humiliation again and go back. I think is that when we had that phone call, he, he, he called me by my native name. My, my, my name, my English name is David. My uh, native name is David. And he called me David. And there was something up with that when he said that. And, and, and that is like, and he says, I would like to show you what I've done to you. And I was curious again, I want to know what he, he's done, you know, what, what, how can he, uh, uh, old man like that defeat a black belt, you know, it was like, and I wanted to know, I was curious. And when I got there, then we just, I sat there for a couple of months on those bags, just watching. And it was up to me. I, I could have partic participated the first day if I wanted to. But uh, I was waiting for the instructor to tell me what to do, the master. And then he had other instructors in there. One of them was Danny that invited me to the, the demonstration. And when I was, and he said, when you're ready, that you would join in. And then a couple months later, I was ready. And I think doing something different, because I was waiting for the real hard stuff, the push-ups, the push-ups on fists and things like that. And um, here I was just... Um, doing dance routines and i couldn't couldn't figure that one out i think my curiosity kept me with him for the uh, seven to eight years that i studied with him is that it was always um, it was never a lesson that you could write in a book uh, it was always something different it was always something there that um that i didn't recognize and it, and it was the dance of death because when you are when you're in shokai that you practice with you, each other you're trusting each other coming so close with a full strike into the eyes or the throat or into the solar plexus that if you made that goal a little bit more, you would actually kill that person. So you, you, the dance of death is a volunteer between two people. Hmm. Now, it, it's, it's a cliche, right? That the statement, when the student is ready, the master will appear. Um, it's a cliche, um, but in my See, there, there's a lot more to this story uh, that, yeah. Yeah, that my father knew Master uh, way, okay. way beyond before I was born. Okay. So uh, that he settled in, um, uh, he, uh, my dad was during the Korean Second World War that a Master came over here because at that time that they, the Japanese, um, when they uh, invaded Pearl Harbor, uh, part of his family was uh, who, um, who attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, master had uh, two brothers. Uh, one uh, of the brothers uh, participated in the uh, Bhutan Death March. I don't know if you heard of that. Mm -hmm. And the other brother fought for the Americans. So there was a, there was a division of the, the two brothers there. Mm -hmm. And um, Master couldn't go back to his village because, uh, because of the, the death march that uh, his, his brother was disgraced in front of their families. And, and my master came here, uh, suggested my father to stay here. And I didn't know that wow. until four or five years ago when my, my mother revealed that to me. Oh. Now, do you think that the master knew who you were and, and, and all that? I mean, was that? Yes. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. But he, did, but he didn't tell you he knew right. your, your father. I mean, there's, there's something. So... Folks who have listened to the show know that, that, you know, I'm, 
I'm pretty darn open minded. I'm pretty open minded about a lot of things, is about you know mysticism and, and philosophy and religion and and just all of the ways that the world could work. And this sounds like one of those stories that just it had some help. I think that's probably the best way I could express it. I, I think it did. It, I think it, my 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 uncle used to say it had some coaching. <laughs> so. But I, but I had to be, um, again, like I said, I, I studied Kung Fu, uh, Jiu Jitsu, you know, all the different Judo. I, I've studied all those. Uh, but it's like, I didn't relate with those instructors, you know. Um, one of the questions is that who would you want to practice with again? I think yeah. that I, in my life, I would like to practice with master again, you know. Mm. Yeah, I don't know because I'm not. Um, uh, burst into the martial art world of who's out there and who's doing what. Uh, master and my grandfather's always taught me to be non nonviolent because nonviolent is not a state of um, physical; it's a state of spiritual. Is that um, we we have to be able to have the spiritual before we have the physical? Because if we don't have the spiritual, and then, then wars will break out again, and that's how wars start. So, sure. Yeah. sure. Now, what's the what's the name of of this art Sho, again? Shokai. Shokai. Yeah. yeah. I want to I want to make sure I get that right. And there's no books written about it. And then the history of Shokai's itself is that uh, during the uh, 12th to the 14th century, the feudal era. I might be wrong about this, but uh, the um, martial arts was illegal to practice in Japan at one time. Because of uh, the Daniel that was out there, and um, this was um, passed down through shopkeepers. Uh, anybody has crafts. Uh, there's a couple stories about the the, the tin maker, uh, and um, it was passed down through that way. It wasn't it wasn't it wasn't ninjutsu, but it was a defense for more of um, the, I would say the middle class. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. I'm I'm gonna see what I can what I can find. It's it's fascinating stuff. Good luck. And yeah, yeah, and and, and I enjoy I enjoy a challenge like that too. It it um you know it it almost sounds it sounds like it was the perfect martial art for you. Yes, and um, you know training with master. You know, I I remember. That I had my own school. I had my own uh, schools out there. I had about 130 to 140 students, and plus I went to master every Tuesdays and Thursdays, and sometimes Saturdays. And I ran my classes in between that. So I spent most of my uh, young life in classes teaching because I started teaching um, uh, martial arts probably when I was 16 or 17. And stayed in his class for a long time, teaching in his class after a while. Most people aren't teaching at 16. How did that happen? Um, you get knocked in the nose. You get um, your teeth knocked out. Uh, uh, at that time, I got stabbed twice. Um, so, yeah, you do have a tendency to, um, to uh, listen more and to be able to, to uh, put this in a practicality uh, form. So it, it was the the real world application of it that led other people to wanting you to teach. Yes. Okay. I remember uh, somebody that uh, was a boxer and um, he came up to me in one of my classes. And he says, if you can knock me down um, and um, because he, he, that's what he was doing. He was going to do for a living boxing. He says, if you can knock me down and I said, I will study with you. I said, when you say knock you down, I said, what do you mean? He says, set me on my butt. So I brought up a chair and I said, have a seat. He sat down. I said, well, welcome to my class. <laughs> <laughs> Did that work? It worked. Uh, he, was, he, awesome. he was impressed with that. And he stayed with me for six and a half years. Yep. Wow. So, wow. Yep. Being, uh, I, I know that I see uh, on computer now all the different martial arts and the craziness that goes on out there. It's like, you know, wow, that's, it wasn't like that when I was, Growing up, 
it was real hard to find a book in Prescott, Maine on martial arts or anything like that. Mm. Yeah. Because I ordered all my books uh, from Boston. And that was they were very limited there, too. Now, you, you brought it up, and we actually talked about it a, a little bit before we started recording. So this might be a good time now. There are folks who are going to be listening to this thinking, this is BS. This is crazy. This, this, we could lump this in with, you know, pick, you know, whatever silliness that you've seen online that people consider to be silly, because we all have a different definition of what that is. And I'm sure that you've experienced that before. I mean, your initial experience with this style, with your, your master there that you've referred to so reverently was disbelief. Part of- so how, how do you, how do you wrap your mind around that? How do we explain to the people, myself included, who have never witnessed this style and the things that go along with it? How do we explain this in a way? Because most, most of the folks listening are engaged in what we would call, quote unquote, more, more normal or standard martial arts, karate, taekwondo, arts that you're familiar with, kung fu. Well, you, you got to remember. How do we explain it to well, them? Well, you got to remember where martial arts came from and, and how it came to be. Do wasn't added uh, until the at least the uh, first 1900s. That means the way. Before that, was, the was reason why it was called martial art is because it was uh, used for defense. It was used in military purposes. Uh, what we're doing now is that it's so exploited and it's online. Uh, you can you know you can find. Just about anything, um, but this is my very first time I ever spoke about this martial art. Um, anytime uh, you won't never find a broadcast of me uh, saying this. This is my very first time over forty some odd years of, of speaking about it. That um, that we I used it in a defense form. Uh, that means that uh, between what I got in the fights and the after that, and I use it a lot in defense because where I'm from, that the, I'm not uh, that accepted as right now. Of course, Native American, but back then I didn't wasn't accepted. I got in a lot. I got in more fights than I can possibly imagine, but I've lost more fights than I won. Mm-hmm. And I think that any martial art like that, that you you would find people like me in the, in there that practices and and, and uses it. For the way of life, and uh, now, but you show Kai the last forty some odd years of the way of life, uh, the philosophy, the the way I conduct myself, the uh, way I, my manners, the way I see things. As that's part of that martial art worked in the Native American part of myself. <laughs> that I, I use both of the philosophies now in my life to get me here, and the ones that think this is BS. Uh, that's fine. They, they have their opinion. I mean, we, we, we out there and we see a lot of different things. And I claim nothing. I, I, I claim that I'm happy, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and compassionate and kind. And that's all I can, I can all, that's all I can say right there. Is, but in any martial art, if you get to the point that you are happy and enjoy life, um, it's not about black belts or anything like that. It's about the, uh, the spiritual contentment and where you are. Hmm. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of things over the years, and especially the last few, because of martial arts radio, because of my opportunity to speak to so many different martial artists, folks such as yourself, people such as those of you who are listening. But we just had a first. I've never had anyone volunteer that they lost more fights than they won, right? That, that's pretty much the opposite of what most of us talk about as martial artists. But what I find really striking about that is I think that that's a pretty good anecdote for for you, at least the way I've come to to know you over the last 45 minutes or so that we've been speaking. And I think there's a lot we can take away from that. My personal view, we learn best when we make mistakes. And so when you lose a fight, there's a lot more opportunity there to, to kind of run the tape back in a sense and say, what could I have done differently? Right. I mean, what would, what's your, what's your takeaway from that? A target makes a very poor impression. Hmm. I find that 
I figured out that I wasn't trying to win fights. I was just trying to get it alive. And then my, my situations where I got into or came out of is that, you know, somebody wanted to hurt you. Um, I think one of the situations I, I can remember that it was like, I think it was four to five guys and they all had things in their hand that were going to hurt me with. And part of that, uh, I could use my ego and stay there and hopefully uh, get one of these people or I can uh, practice the way of the bird, fly away or run away. And I decided that day that I was going to fly away. And I, I know that I tell this to my students. I say, oh, you could have broke their arms and think that. I said, yeah, I could have probably done that, but they could have had them because in a, in a, a combat situation that you get into, you don't know if they have a gun, a knife, or a shotgun, or somebody else is going to come in. Is that if you if you take the fight, at least you are free. And I still think that that was the right decision I made. You know, because I, because when I tell my students, I tell that students with they have axe handles and knives and like that, and I break it up and I said I just ran away, but I'm live. But people don't understand that they they just because you you practice in the martial art in years and years that you can break somebody's arm is something that like says the, the, the chickens at Kentucky Fried Chicken didn't run. They'd be eaten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, I get that. One of the things that we we've talked about kind of in passing that my, my gut tells me that there's, there's more to talk about here. So I hope it's okay is is where where you came from right you we, we talked about your your native lineage and and you know we talked a little bit before the show that that's still you know that that's a substantial part of your life it's who you are is the combination i guess of of these two traditions this this native tradition that you come from culturally and this old martial arts tradition that you stepped into, what is the fusion or combination of those look like for you? I think that's a part of any story, that, that combination of how we um, adapt ourselves to different teachings. The teachings from the native tradition and the Japanese tradition fit like a glove. Uh, they, 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 they're the opposite of the quality. Uh, there are parts of the, I don't understand how they fit so well sometimes uh, because my, my philosophy now was, is peace and quiet over excitement. And that's hard to do in this day and age because, you know, some, uh, somebody said, well, why don't you, uh, uh, take on 40 people at one time and, and that would be a good demonstration but that's a demonstration to somebody else but what master taught me is that peace and quiet over excitement that I, I, I learned martial arts out of anger when I first started and that was my um, initiative, that was my motivation of, of practicing because I didn't want to be hurt anymore so I ended up um, practicing six, seven hours a day for you know, for seven to eight years of just, you know, but I was uh, practicing for a fight that would never happen. I was um, fighting against myself. Is that I remember um, when uh, somebody tried to hit me and I figured that these, this person's awful slow and he's there's trying to hit me and kick me and all the different things. And, and I was just blocking and moving out of this person's way. But that's after six years with master, though. Um, before that, I would have handled it a whole different way. That the guy ended up getting tired and um, just ended up getting frustrated and walking away. But that choice then that I could do that, that I was not anger, that I had a little bit of control of my anger at that time. The people don't realize that how much ego rules our, our human spirit is that, you know, may embarrass us if we're going to say we're going to give them 
road rage. You take road rage. That's the same way. Uh, we practice, we have a, a 210 car in front of us, so we're safe. And somebody uh, cuts in front of us, we give them a finger, you know, and we're safe because the car is going to protect us. But out of the car, it's a whole different thing. You know, it's like, all right, what should that person has a gun, what's a knife, or you, you see it online, people getting road rage and getting beat up or something. That this is the same way with our ourselves, our spiritual self. Is that, yeah, this is like this is quite a story. But don't we all have quite a story? That's what I was thinking. Is like I've heard, I heard uh, weirder stories than this. And this is ain't all the story. This is not even page one of, of of the story. I mean, between all the classes and all the classes that I've taught and all the people that I've taught, this stories upon story. We can write a novel if we wanted to here. <laughs> so. And I think it would make a, a great novel and, and maybe someday you'll, you'll find the, the time yeah. to do that. Cause I think people would, would read this. It'd be interesting. I'm not much of a writer. Yeah. Uh, my, my schedule, because um, my, my, of course, life changes that I, I was a master carpenter for many years and, and uh, built houses and built all kinds of things. Now my life has changed the last couple of years that I'm, I'm a jeweler now that I'm, I make jewelry. Uh, that um, a master was a um, a craftsperson himself. He was a master sword builder. That uh, he come, his family built swords for emperors, and he he taught me how to build knives and swords and katanas and all the different things. Mm. Yeah. Oh, fascinating! Uh, and I'm a blacksmith before that too. I, I built <laughs> uh, shoot horses. <laughs> You've done a bunch of different things in very much. But martial arts has been kind of the the constant thread. It sounds like. Well, it it it, um, it, it brought myself together, uh, gave me a focus that I didn't think of the, the practice. Like, oh, you know, martial arts. That's that's not what was ever was. It was part of my life. It was part of my spiritualism now of of who I am. Uh, but when I pray each day, that usually then I'm, I'm usually doing kata or keeping myself limber. I still practice every day. You only stop practice. The, the, uh, the first lesson in practice that Master taught me is to breathe. And he said, the last lesson uh, that you're ever going to learn is breathe, not to breathe. Yeah. And if someone was to come to one of your classes, I mean, you, you gave us an example of what their dem the demonstration from this Shokai art looked like and, and what your first experience stepping into their their school their dojo looked like what does it look like today when you're teaching it um you 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 immediately add it to the class um and start doing what everybody else is doing breathing uh dancing and and um and practicing the uh the secret to our class is new students to any class it should be always new students why uh because if we get practice that we take one class and we practice for that class some 20 people for five years, we only get the, the, the teachings for 20 people. Because there's a thousand movements out there that you don't know, and the new students will bring them in. Hmm. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, that um, we practice uh, blocks, strikes, uh, takedowns, all the different things. Uh, with uh, You say that I, I use my top student. And he pretty well knows your, uh, what you're going to do. And usually if you throw him, he's going to go with the throw. But uh, we want people to be able to resist it from that. Um, if I'm going to throw somebody, I want to be able to somebody that not knowing what I'm doing. So the throw is proficient, not, not uh, contrived. That's the, that's the secret of the new students, the instructors. Is that they get, because you're always instructing over and over and over. It's never the point that you're going to instruct the same kata over because People do kata in different ways because they're shorter, uh, some are stronger, some are weaker, but you want to have some sort of a general idea on, on, on what that throw is going to be like and where the center is, how to find the center, because finding a center with a 250-pound person and 180-pound person is a whole different thing. That The methodology is different. And the new, two, new students would teach us that. Cool. There, it, it sounds like the, I guess the philosophical side of this art is a little more front and center than 
and some other arts. Yeah, that's is, that, is that fair? Yeah, we we have a, a lot of katas and uh, we have methodology to the takedowns and things like that. But we have room for improvement always. It reminds me. I mean, you you compared it to Tai Chi in in your first description, and it sounds it sounds similar. Not not um, not in the way that that Tai Chi is often taught here in the United States as a just a movement practice. But if you get into the martial arts side of Tai Chi, it sounds very similar to what I understand of that. Is that a fair comparison? Tai Chi with a fifty pound rock. Oh, yeah. What do you mean? Well, the, the, you, you think of Tai Chi as the free mo- movement energy, and it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, our art is like, all right, you can do the movements, but try to do it with a 50 pound rock in your hand and bring the rock above your head, side, underneath, and use that rock uh, to practice with. Because uh, Shokai is, um, is a, uh, I remember going to master's class. I, I ordered a um, bow staff, and it was a, well balanced bow staff, and it was, I think it cost me forty bucks. And um, I brought it in the class, and he said, "Oh, great! I, I needed one of those." And he took it and stuck it in his garden, so the vines would grow on it. And uh, I could never figure out for a couple of months why he did that, but I left that there, and the vines, of course, the vines grow on it. He's, and he says, "I'll go find me a bow staff out in the woods." And and I went out and found a maple that was pretty straight, and I cut that. And, that was my bow staff for um, five years mm. because the balance of things, uh, even chucks, uh, you know, um, the, the original chucks weren't balanced, uh, you know, that I had swivels on mine that um, I made mine with a uh, horse hair and, and um, used it such a way uh, uh, to use the wood, uh, braid it into the wood. So it'd be a chuck because the original chucks were for rice. And uh, mm. to, to make them uneven, to, uh, to be able to use something uneven, even the sword, the bow staff, the short staff, the Joe, all the ones that, that I made myself. And, he, and the weighted rope, the, the, the weighted rope is a, it's a, um, a weapon like the dart, but it's, um, it's uh, just a rope and a, a four ounce lead ball on the end of it uh, with a, a monkey fist holding the, the thing and using that. And that's 16 feet. And what that was used for is to knock uh, people off horses. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Now, what's keeping you going? You know, you're, you're, you're passionate, you're teaching, you're training. Why? It's my favorite question to ask our guests. Why? What's your why? My why is that I enjoy life. Uh, I remember being young and practicing on the beaches with master and all the different places and, and students. But I, I just enjoy life as it is today. I, I enjoy what I do. I've, I, I'm privileged to even to share my life with my, my wife and my, my dog and everything else. I, I enjoy life today. I mean, I don't consider myself a martial artist. I consider myself a person that moves with the wind. I guess that's the only way I can describe it, is that when I'm outside, um, we practice in all elements. We, sometimes we practice inside. But um, most of our dojo is the day. Uh, if it's pouring rain, we're out practicing. If it's uh, 110 degrees, we're out practicing. If it's a nice day, we're practicing. Um, so there's um, no excuse uh, not to practice. And, and that's the way Shokai is that we practice in all elements. So. And my, my instructors do the same thing. They, they make sure that when we first get in, that we practice in the elements first because when we get into situations, when we get into um, conflicts, that it's never seventy. It might be seventy degrees, but it might be the dark of night. It might be raining. It might be might getting out of the car. Uh, somebody might have a gun to you. Yeah, and we, we we work with the body itself because part of um, being a martial artist, master made sure that I knew about anatomy, as to how the body worked, and physics, and all the different other um, scientists that go with it, from chemistry to to um, uh, how to sharpen a blade. And if people want to find you online, I know you have a website that you sent some links and we'll be sure to put those in, in the show notes, which for anyway, it might be new whistlekick martial arts radio.com. But for folks that 
you know, are, are poised with pen and paper <laughs> as I am or, or, or otherwise have a great memory, you know, where, where should we send them? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just look at those sites. Um, I know I have a lot of people that uh, come from different places to come to the class and the expectation is to see an old man creeping along, but you know, I'm, I'm not that old, you know, I, I, I can still run a 20 year old. So um, <laughs> to be patient with, with this practice, because it's not what you think, you know, we, we don't have you down there doing push ups over and over and over. We're, we're learning about the, the spiritual science, about the body itself and how the body works, uh, what you can put up with, what you can't put up with, what gets you mad, uh, uh, what makes you happy. Um, you know, we have all different sizes uh, in group is that everybody could be a martial artist. All they have to do is stay with it. That's all. Just to basically stay with it. Awesome. Awesome. And as we wind up here, what parting words would you give to the folks who are listening? Every martial art out there, anything that deals with the martial arts, practice. Uh, because there's, there's no one particular martial art that will work the best is what works for you. And if it works for you, then it's, that's when you should train with. Um, people are so general in going in different martial arts and looking for the greatest martial arts, you know, and everything else. It's what works for you, you know. If it is um, beating your hands into a beach, uh, on a beach and, and, and squeezing sand and that works for you, that's a martial art. Because martial art, remember, it is, there's a thousands and thousands over years that have been lost. And to find the true martial art is the true martial art. You find it in yourself. It's no secret that the best episodes, the best conversations I get to have with our guests happen with the most open individuals. And Master Senapass certainly was open about his past, his childhood, the way he found martial arts, and a lot of the emotion that occurred, the things that he felt at these various stages of his life. It's true, there were some elements of today's conversation that seemed a bit fantastic. But really, when we look at all the other things that we've heard from our guests over the last few years, there's nothing about this that makes me question. There's a lot that goes on. There's a lot of oddity that happens in our lives. I've experienced some pretty crazy things, both in and outside of the martial arts. And that's why I'm so honored the Master Senapass trusted me and trusted us to be so open. So thank you, sir. I do hope that we get to meet up at some point in the future. If you want to check out the show notes with photos and so, so much more, whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter or head on over to whistlekick.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there too. And you can save 15% by using the code PODCAST15 on our gear, our uniforms, our apparel, just a ton of stuff. Check it out. We're on social media, at Whistlekick on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. We're always looking for great guest suggestions. So you can fill out the form at the podcast website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or you can email me directly for that, or for any other reason, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I hope you have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and don't worry, we'll be back soon. But until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 